Hi, everybody. Welcome back to session three of 40 Days of Community. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love watching cop shows on TV. Dragnet, Adam 12, Hawaii 5 0. And what I noticed about these guys is that they always had a partner. Joe Friday had Bill Gannon, Malloy had Reed, McGarrett had Dano, even Andy of Mayberry had Barney Fife. Now, each of these guys had a badge and a gun, and they had their weapons and handcuffs. They had the authority to do the job, but there's one thing they all did when they got into trouble. They called for backup because they knew that they had a much better chance of success against the bad guys if they had somebody with them. Now, you know, that's really a great picture of the Christian life. We have our authority in Christ. He's our badge. We have our weapons of faith, prayer, and the Word of God. And we read about these in Ephesians 6, but we all need spiritual partners. We all need a team that we can call for backup, for reinforcements, for more firepower. Really, there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. In fact, even a Lone Ranger at Tonto, when you think about it. So I guess he wasn't so alone after all. We're better together, and we belong together, and that's how God planned it. Did you know that there are 56 kinds of one another's in the Bible? We've been reading about them together in our daily devotions during 40 Days of Community. The Bible tells us to love one another, to serve one another, to pray for one another, to be kind to one another, to live in peace with each other and encourage each other and to have mercy and compassion on each other and to spur each other on to, to good works. Now, we can't do any of the one another's if we're alone. So it was God's purpose from the very beginning that we belong together. This is one of the great truths of Scripture that we learned in 40 Days of Purpose. We're not just supposed to be believers. We're supposed to be belongers. And we belong together in the family of God. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. What does that mean? It means we need each other. And it's all about love, folks. We belong together. Now, why is that so important to God? Because Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Jesus is saying that the number one characteristic of being a follower of Jesus is love. And there's only one way to demonstrate that love is to begin to show it to each other, and that's called fellowship. You know, recently a survey was conducted of 39 different denominations, and they were searching for the most important key to church growth. What is it that causes churches to grow? Why do some of them explode with growth and others just that seem as dedicated and committed, die on the vine. Are there any factors that you can find in every growing church, regardless of denomination or doctrine or location or culture? The answer is yes. The survey revealed that the number one characteristic of a growing church, listen to this, was the atmosphere of love among the members. Now, it's interesting that they rated all of these different denominations, and they asked the people in each of them, is your church loving, or is it not loving, or is it friendly or unfriendly? And they came to the conclusion that loving churches attract more people. Loving churches grow, and growing churches love. Now, that seems to make sense. I mean, it's obvious. When Christians begin to really love each other the way God wants us to love each other, then the world is going to become to Christ. And if you build a church and grow a church where people genuinely love each other and experience deep, heartfelt, gut-level, emotional fellowship, you'd have to lock doors to keep the people out. People are looking for love. So how do we do this? How do we show love to each other? How do we build community through the attitude of love? Well, what does it look like? What does it look like in our small groups and in our friendships with other Christians? Well, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 7. And we're going to look at this one verse, one phrase at a time. First, the Bible says, love always protects. Now, what does that mean? How does love protect? Well, we protect people we love by praying for them, by surrounding them with our strengths when they're weak. 
and by protecting their confidentiality of their struggles and their heartaches. You know, nothing will destroy a friendship or the fellowship of a small group faster than gossip. Proverbs 11.13 says this, A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. Do you? Do you keep a secret? Can you keep a secret? I heard about three pastors who were out fishing, and they all said, let's share our greatest sin. And uh, the one that's their biggest problem, one guy said, well, my problem is greed. I, I have a love for money. And the next guy said, well, my problem is lust. He said, I, I just can't keep my eyes off of other women. And the third pastor said, well, my problem's gossip, and I, I can't wait to get back to tell everybody. <laughs> a true friend is somebody who listens without having a burning desire to broadcast it to everybody else. Did you know that that word where it says love always protects? That word in the verse literally means to cover over with silence. When a friend confesses a hurt or a struggle or a sin to you, you keep their confidence by keeping your mouth closed and protecting the privacy of others. You see, the Bible roundly condemns gossip. Now, what is it? Well, gossip is talking about a situation with somebody who's neither part of the problem nor part of the solution. If they're not part of the problem or they're not part of the solution and you're talking with them about it, that is gossip. And the Bible says God hates it. He hates gossip. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, what we're doing a lot of times is making ourselves feel better uh, at the expense of somebody else. We're talking about their hurts and their problems to make us feel like we're a little bit more morally superior to them. And that's the danger and that's the hurt of gossip. Gossip is such a dangerous thing that one of the values we have at our small groups here at Saddleback Church is to keep confidences, that you agree what's said in the group stays in the group. Whether it's a small group, as recovery, or any other kind, it's a place where you can come and talk about what you're facing in your life and it stays with the people you're sharing it with because that's an important part of our relationships. We build community through confidentiality. Now, are you the kind of person that can keep people's confidences so they can trust in you? If they don't trust you, they're not gonna share anything with you. You know, we tend to think of gossip as one of those little tiny sins, a, a misdemeanor sin. But when God talks about gossip, he, listen to this, he puts it on the same list with things like sexual immorality and murder. Really, in the same list. Why? Because it is so destructive to relationships. Gossip probably destroys more churches than any other thing. Gossip can tear a friendship apart, it can tear a family apart, it can tear a small group apart, and it can tear a church apart, it can even turn a tear a community apart. More friendships and churches, as I said, have been destroyed by gossip than any other kind of disloyalty. It is incredibly destructive when you trust somebody and then you find out that you couldn't trust them. Now, not only does a friend refuse to gossip, a friend stops gossip in its tracks when he or she hears it because he always protects. That's what love does. Did you know that when you pass on stolen goods, you're as guilty by in courts as the someone who stole it. And when you pass on gossip, you are as guilty as the person who invented it. Love always protects. That's how we build community, by not gossiping. Number two, love always trusts. Now the word for trust here is the word believe, pistevo in Greek. In, in, in love, we believe in each other. And now, this is very important, we believe for each other. Believing each other makes us vulnerable. And you could be lying to me or I could be lying to you. Have you ever known somebody who is always getting hurt by other people? We usually call that person gullible. But maybe they're not gullible. Maybe they're just a little bit more loving than the rest of us because love, the Bible says, always trusts. Love says, I'm going to believe you before I doubt you. Love says you're innocent until proven guilty. Love says I'm not starting you off with an empty account. I'm starting you off with a full account. Love says I'm taking you at your word. And when we love like that, we love like Christ and we believe in each other. But we not, must not only believe with each other, we must also believe for each other. You know, in Matthew 9, we read the account of where Four men brought their bedridden friend to Jesus, and when they get into the house where Jesus was staying, the crowd was so thick 
they couldn't get into the, in, in through to Jesus. So as you remember the story, they cut a hole in the roof and they, they lowered their friend, bed and all, right in front of Jesus. And you talk about taking cuts in line. <laughs> Why did they do this? Because they loved their friend. And because they believed that Jesus could heal him. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw their faith, listen to this, when he saw their faith, he healed the man. Now notice it wasn't the man's faith that healed him. It was the faith of the friends. You know, sometimes we can't get to Jesus on our own. We're just too sick or we're too beat up or too discouraged or too depressed or too worn out or too, you know, devastated by what we've been through. And we don't even know how to pray. That's when we need each other. That's when we need community. That's when we need the love of our friends, the love of people that always believes to bring us before the Lord in prayer. And I have to say that in my life, there have been many times when I was going through a dark hole and other people believed God for me, when I didn't have the faith to believe myself in God or in God working in my life. But just as God will answer the prayers of others when they believe for us, God will answer your prayers when you believe for others. The Bible says love always trusts and love always protects. Number three, love always hopes. And this is the third thing that builds community in our small groups or in our churches. Love is filled with joyful expectation. That's what hope means. H-O-P-E is holding on, praying expectantly. You see, a true friend wants you to win. And a real test of friendship is how you handle your friend's successes. When they get to do something you don't do, somebody in your group uh, gets, a, gets to buy a new house or something you don't get to buy, or somebody in your small group or your church gets a promotion. I've seen promotions ruin friendships many times. Do you get jealous of your friends? Love always hopes. Do you secretly compete with them? Love always hopes. You see, a real friend will love you even when you're a success. A real friend will let you talk about your victories, and they won't think you're bragging. Everybody needs somebody that they can share the joys in their life with and without being felt put down for it, that, that their family, that their friends, that their loved ones, that you can say, this is something that was neat that happened to me, and they're excited for you, not jealous. You know, the secret of having a lot of friends, and by the way, the secret of a good marriage is the same, is to be enthusiastic about other people's accomplishments. That's the key. Become a cheering section, a fan club. Let people know that you're pulling for them. Let people know that you're praying for them, that you're hoping the best for their lives. Because everybody in the world is discouraged. Did you know that? Everybody's hurting somewhere. Everybody has a hidden hurt, and everybody... I mean, everybody needs encouragement. And if you become an encourager, you will become the most popular person around. If you learn to get excited about people's successes, you're going to have all the friends you want. Now, how do you know when you're a real friend? You rejoice in the victories of others. Now, the fourth thing this verse says is love always perseveres. What does that mean? It means love hangs in there with people. It goes the extra mile. Love walks in when everybody else is walking out. That means we're always there for each other. And when somebody calls for backup, we drop everything we're doing, and we come running to their side to help. You know, let me just share a testimony here. This last year, my wife went through major cancer and had surgery and had chemo and had radiation. You know, when you go through something like that, you find out who your friends are. And it was interesting to me to find out who showed up at the door, who showed up at the hospital, who showed up uh, caring and bringing meals. It wasn't always the people I expected. But it's in those situations when you're down, when you need help, that that's where real love shows up. And I would like to just ask you a question. Do you ever care about sick people? I think that's a test of character. Do you ever care about sick people? Or are you too busy to ever make a hospital visit or to visit a sick or to take a meal? If you are, you're too busy. You see, not only does love trust and love helps and love is trustworthy, love can be counted on in the good times and in the hard times because love perseveres. It perseveres by putting up with each other 
You know, you hear people talk about tough love. Well, love must be tough. Tough enough that you don't run away every time your feelings get hurt. I know some people that every time they get feelings hurt, they move to a new church. Now, believe me, your feelings are going to be hurt by people, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. In fact, they're going to be hurt by those you love. In fact, the people you love the most have the greatest potential to hurt you. And you're going to hurt their feelings too at some time or another. We all do it. We don't mean to, but it happens. But love is tough. It perseveres. It sticks it out. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. That means friends can be counted on. They're dependable. They're in your corner when they see you cornered. A friend will see you through when others see you through. They're there. They stand with you through thick and thin. You know, Proverbs 18, 24 says this. I love it in the Good News translation. Some friendships do not last, but some friends are more loyal than brothers. Isn't that true? You probably have some Christian friends that you're closer to maybe than even your own blood kinship because loyalty means being committed and friendships begin with commitment. You see, there's no such thing as love without commitment. People say, well, I love you, but I'm not committed to you. Well, they, never, no, they don't really love you. Genuine love is based on personal commitment. Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Now think about that. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That means treat each other like family. We treat each other as brothers and sisters in the family of God. Now you know today, commitment is a lost value in our society. We don't like it. In fact, most people today are afraid of commitment. They say, I don't want to commit to anything. I don't want to commit to any person, any program, any career, any relationship. I don't want to commit to any one church. In fact, they're really afraid of commitment. And yet love is becoming personally committed to people that you love. The Bible says in Romans 12, 5, in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. If you have your study guide there, I want you to circle the word belongs there in your study guide. We said this in 40 Days of Purpose, but I want to say it again. If you're a believer, you belong to every other believer. You're not a Lone Ranger Christian. They belong to you and you belong to them. And when you become a Christian, you don't just become a believer. You become a belonger to the family of God. You know, sometimes I hear people say, what's the big deal about church membership? Why, why should I belong to a church? Well, membership simply means commitment. It's like the difference between living together and getting married. You know, if you just attend a church, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're not that committed to it. You, you could leave at any point. But when you join a church, you're saying, I'm committed. Now, when you commit your life to Christ, you become a Christian. When you commit your life to other people, you become a member of that local body, some family, some church. And this is important because now you're growing. First, you commit your life to Christ. Now you commit your life to another group of believers. And then you commit your life to a group and a small group to grow personally. God wants you to have friendships, close, meaningful, satisfying, significant friendships that build you up and don't tear you down, that encourage you spiritually, not discourage you. And God wants you to be that kind of friend to other people. He wants you to be a consistent friend, a friend who always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always per perseveres. Now, I know you'd like to have friends like that, people who trust you, who hope in you, who believe in you, who persevere in you. My question is, are you that kind of friend to anybody else? Can you name one person who knows that you're that kind of friend to them? The most important thing you could do for somebody is to introduce them to your friend, Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the friendliest thing you can do. Did you know here at our church, over 80% of the people who came to Saddleback Church first came because they were invited by a friend or a relative. Who have you invited to church lately? Is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? As I said, the friendliest thing you can do is share Christ. You know, if I had the cure for cancer, I'd shout it in the streets. But I've got something better than that. I, know I have the cure to the sin problem. I have the secret of eternal life. 
And when you make a friend for Jesus, you're making a friend for life. No, you're making a friend for eternity. So let me encourage you this week to do some kind of act of friendliness and invite somebody to church with you. Bring them in. Help them to belong. The world is full of lonely people. Everybody wants to belong to something significant. And there's nothing more significant than the kingdom of God and the, the body of Christ is church. You know, the number one reason people come to Christ is because of friendship. There was a study of 15,000 people in America, and they asked, why did you become a follower of Jesus Christ? Why did you join a church? And over 90% of the people said, I came because I was invited by a friend or a relative. They were brought to Jesus, just like those four men took that man to Jesus. You know, they say you can't take anything with you to heaven, but you are going to take your friends with you if you lead them to Christ. And during your discussion time, I want you to think about two things. First, how can we build fellowship in our small group built on these four things? And then second, how can we invite people in to our church and make them a part of our family because we love them the way God loves them? Their eternal destiny may just depend on it. God bless you. I'd like to close in prayer. Father, as we've talked about this important task of building fellowship, we know that when we love each other, it is attractive and other people want to be a part of it. And I pray that we will learn real fellowship, fellowship that always loves and protects and trusts and hopes and perseveres. Help us to practice the kind of love that you give to us, Lord. In your name we pray.